Hello, everybody. David Burns here with you for another live stream. Thank you for joining me tonight. Looking forward to spending some time with everybody. And thank you so many of you who have already joined the uh, chat today. Good to hear from you guys. Good to see you. Hope your day is going fantastic. And uh, mine has gone pretty well today. We've had some great weather for bees lately. I've been in a lot of hives, doing a lot of bee work, staying busy, really enjoying the nice weather. So I'm totally, totally uh, running out of time. The day goes so fast when the weather's nice <laughs> and there's a lot of activities to do. And uh, so, boy, it's been fun being in the bees and doing a lot of filming. I've got more film and more videos than I know what to do with on the editing. So, wow, that's really good. Been trying to do a, a little more video uh, taping in 4K, and that has that produces some very beautiful videos. But I got to be honest with you, it just is terrible in the edit room. It takes so long for 4K to process, and it takes so long to upload 4K. I don't think it's worth it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to probably have to go back to my regular ones because 4K is killing me. I was going to post a video today, but it took so long to render it, and then the upload was going to be forever. So, uh, But anyway, it is beautiful to watch that. So want to say hello to all of you in the comment section there. I know many are piling in and crowding in at the last minute, so come on into the live stream. And if you have questions, feel free to ask your questions along the way. We may not answer all of them, so let me go out ahead of you and say I will try to answer as many of your questions questions as I can, but obviously sometimes it gets overwhelming and we just can't answer all of them, but we'll try my best. Also, let me say that thank you so much for watching my YouTube channel. It's great to have so many new subscribers. So many of you are commenting on my YouTube channel. I appreciate that so much. Again, this is a place for you to ask your uh, questions when you watch one of my videos. So keep that in mind as well. Like, okay, You've got to realize I can't answer all the comments on my YouTube channel, but when we're on live stream, I'll do my best to answer as many as I can. Thank you, Don Potter, for starting off the super sticker tonight. I appreciate that so much. $20, Don. Means a lot. It means a lot. Uh, someone recently said on a YouTube uh, comment that they appreciated what I do, that they realize it takes a lot of effort to do it. And it's just terrible. I mean, out in the yard with cameras in the bee yard, I, I've I've ruined one of my tripods last week. Uh, broke one of the uh, legs on it, and there was just it's just so disastrous to be out there filming. <laughs> it's there's so many things being thrown in trucks and golf carts and tripods and cameras. So any little bit of uh, donations that you make <laughs> will help a lot. So I appreciate that. It seems like I go through tripods because I'm rapidly trying to change the, the height of it. I'm rapidly trying to deploy them to get a scene. So I appreciate that, Don. It means a lot to me. But what I want to start off with tonight, guys, is I promise to talk about queen cells. Some of you are so new to beekeeping that you really don't understand queen cells. So I just want to have a brief little explanation, and I'll throw some pictures out there. But I want to talk about queen cells because that is important. I love queen cells. I have spent many, many years raising queens, and I love to raise queens. Queens are so fun to raise. So I have seen all sorts of queen cells through my um, career as a queen rearer, a queen producer. But I want to show you this right here. Look at this. These are queen cells. Now, this is a frame of uh, brood. You can see where there's uh, some drawn or some capped over brood in the middle. A little dot there that's a drone a brood sticking out toward the top. And an arrow will show you over here on the right side where there's capped over honey. And over here, queen emerged from cell. You can see the cells torn open a little bit. So what I did for this frame, so that that queen wouldn't kill the other queen cells, I kind of made the my own little queen cages. Back then, when I took this picture, they did not have, believe it or not, they did not have plastic queen cages. <laughs> we had to make our own, and I'm using uh, one eighth inch hardware cloth, it's called. Made my own, made little legs on them, punched them in to protect 
the queen cells. If I didn't do that, then the, the, the queen that got out would kill these. So I'm just going to try to harvest these out as soon as they emerge. But these are what I call caged queen cells. And there's some bee bread over on the left. You can probably see that and then sealed brood in the middle. Now let's talk about what are these? Are they swarm cells or are they supersedure cells? A supersedure, by the way, means that the queen is failing, that they want to replace her for some reason, and they raise another queen while she's still walking around laying eggs. They'll raise another queen to replace her. That's called superseding the queen, replacing her. Supersedure queen cells are often found in the location where we see these, in the middle, kind of the middle of the uh, frame. Now, there's apparently three that we can see here. That's a little bit unusual to see three supersedure cells. It's not, you know, impossible to believe that these are supersedure cells because there's three of them. Normally, when I see supersedure cells where the queen's being replaced, I just see one. And it's a very, very large one, like the one here at the bottom. The one up a little higher appears to me to be a little bit smaller. I think it's worth saying right now that I'm concerned about smaller size queen cells. Because if they're smaller, it could mean there's not sufficient amount of royal jelly in that cell and that the queen may have not have been fed a sufficient amount of royal jelly uh, as a larvae, you know, being fed as a larvae. So that concerns me. Anytime I see a very small queen cell, I consider that probably not going to be a very good queen. It doesn't mean always. Never means never. So who knows? But the one at the bottom, you can really tell the one at the bottom really looks good. Now, here's a nice sized queen. This is one of the queens I raised one year. And she's surrounded by a retinue. A retinue is a word for those that are attending to her in a circle. And notice how all these bees are facing her, picking up her pheromones. They clean her. They feed her. They take care of her. Now, when I first saw this particular queen, I was astonished that she was so, so black in color. Now, as she did age, she did get a slight more brown to her abdomen on top there, but not much. And you might wonder, you might notice too, why is she show, Why is she so shiny? Now, when you see a queen, I know we're talking about queen cells, but just a minute. When you see a queen like this, has a very shiny thorax, a very shiny abdomen, this is what it means. It means that she was not readily accepted by the hive. And during the time that she was trying to be accepted, the bees were bawling her. They were picking at her. They literally picked the hairs off of her. That's what happens when you see a robber bee. A robber bee usually is very shiny because bees have been attacking it and pulling the hairs off. So that's, I thought that was an interesting photo of a queen based on her color. Her wings were slightly damaged in the fight, but she turned out to be an outstanding laying queen. Now look at this. This is more typical of what we see and we panic that we have queen cells. Now, these queen cells all look pretty good to me. There's a few at the top that are very small. There's some drone, uh, capped over drone cells around it. Those aren't queen cells. It's just the ones that are very long. The ones that are more like your pinky that are, that are vertical uh, with the comb, those are the, the swarm cells that we see here. Now, when I see this many charged in one place like this, I automatically think, you know, swarm cells. But swarm cells are typically on the lower half of most of the frames. So a lot of times we might think, I don't know if that's a swarm cell or a supersedure cell. And to be honest with you, a lot of times we don't know. It's right on the borderline. What tells us is more of the condition of the colony. If we see a poor laying pattern of the queen, and she hasn't been doing well at all, and the queen's not very big in number, well, then it's only right to assume that's a supersedure cell. But if the, if the hive is robust, they're, they're just heavily populated, they're extremely healthy, and there's good brood all over the place, you know, very healthy brood, there's a lot of good laying brood going on, 
it's only right to assume that it's going it, to, those are swarm cells. So we have to not just rely on the appearance of the cell, but the overall assessment of the colony. Does that not make sense? All right, one more thing I want to uh, share with you guys is about cups or cells. We make the mistake, I sometimes uh, misspeak and I'll call a cell a cup or a cup of cell. But a queen cup is what mean, it means it is not capped over like these are in the picture. These are cells. They're capped over at the bottom. They're completely sealed off. They're queen cells. If they're ever um, like a cup where you can see into the cell from the bottom, those are called cups. All colonies, most colonies, almost all colonies will have queen cups scattered throughout the frames all year long. Now, it's no need to worry about that. Sometimes it just means they're there in case they need them. And if it happens where they need them, the queen may happen to lay an egg in there. It's there in case they need it. It doesn't mean something is going to happen the next day or the next 10 days. I've, I've watched queen cups remain, on, especially on the bottom of frames, indefinitely. And they never go away. And the queen never lays in them. But there's always queen cups on the bottom. So... I've had I've made many videos for you guys showing that if you ever do see these queen cups, I want you to best you can move the bees out of the way, look into those cups with a flashlight and see if there's a larvae, any royal jelly, an egg in there. And if not, nothing's going on. They're just in standby mode. Now, this queen cell here, I actually found it in another frame and I strategically removed it by cutting it and I placed it in this mating nuke. Now you can see, I just took a little bit of the top above the queen cell, part of that comb, and I moved it over here into this frame and just kind of used the wax to make wax stick to wax at the top without, without damaging the actual cell. These cells, when you're not sure what age they are, listen carefully, please don't turn them away from their vertical position. Because if the queen is not yet 13 days old from the time the egg was laid, and you take a cell, you harvest it, and you turn it horizontal, you potentially will damage the queen. A lot of people don't understand that. You can't jar queen cells. You can't turn them horizontal. You'll damage her wings, and she'll never be able to take a mating flight. So anytime you're handling these queen cells, you're not sure what day they are. Um, because you really can't always tell, be sure and just assume they're not old enough to be handled rough yet or to be turned horizontal. Keep them vertically. So in this case, this is a pupae because it's capped over. And in this case, it needs to be kept 92.5. And so I just quickly put it in here, punched it in there, set it back down. That's how you handle when you're wanting to remove queen cells and put them in a different hive. Now you can keep them on the same frame and move the frame over, and that's probably a better method as well. Now, look at these queen cells. Looks like there's, I don't know, I see two. I see one on the right side that's open maybe, but that could be a drone uh, cell. Who knows? But let's just say there's definitely two there. So are these uh, substantial in size or are these too small? How do you know whether you're going to get a good queen out of that? You really don't know because sometimes the queen cell is larger than it appears because the top of it may be deeper into the comb. You can't always tell. Sometimes they're hanging so beautifully on the outside of the comb that the length of it is very measurable. But sometimes like these, you don't know really how far back it goes into the comb because when it first starts to be built out, it starts being built out in a horizontal way, just like a worker cell, but then they curve it down. So it's really hard to say on that. But if I had to, if you wanted me to pick one, which was which one is healthier, I'm going to go for the one on the left. It just looks better. <laughs> but it even looks too small. I'm a little nervous about that one. I remember once on my master beekeeper uh, certification test, we were either, yeah, we were given queen cells on the table and we were asked to identify which one is the most healthiest, the queen cell. And that's kind of some of the things we use. We use the size because we feel like if the queen developing in the cell has been well-fed and, and we call it being massaged on the outside, if the bees massage the cell very large, it's 
probably going to be a much better queen. Now, this is a good example of a very healthy queen that I raised. You can see how large she is. The, the everything's a little bit bigger on a queen, you know, but notice the wings. For those of you that are wondering, how do I, how do I find my queen? Well, you know, you can see here that her abdomen is much longer. Look at the worker bee. See the one worker bee a little bit to the right of her down low? Notice how the worker bee's wings go almost to the end of their abdomen. Whereas the queen, her bee or her wings only go about halfway down her abdomen because her abdomen is so long. And so she, she's beautiful looking. And then here's one of my nook yards where I, you put the mating nooks out. I don't know how many mating nooks are there, but sometimes people ask me, how close can mating nooks be? Do I need to separate them? Do I need to point them in different directions? Sometimes I use 10 frames. There's a couple of three frames in there right there at the bottom. That's a three frame mating nook. The other ones are 10 or five frames. And you can see they're kind of facing different directions, different sizes. And I don't know how many that is out there. It looks like there's 20, 30, 40, 50 boxes to put mating nooks in. So it's fun to raise queens, uh, but you do need to know how to judge the queen cells to make a big difference when, when you're trying to judge which of these queen cells are gonna be good ones, which ones are gonna make it, which ones you might wanna consider um, uh, destroying. So in my case, if I had a whole bunch of queen cells and one tiny one, I'm gonna destroy the tiny one. Hey, Brian Bennett, $10. Thank you, Brian. Good to see you again. Good to hear from you. Why is my green drone comb full of, why is it full of nectar? Thanks, David. Bees love to add nectar. And this time of the year in the spring, Brian, it's, it's a challenge to get those green drone comb pulled out the way you want them to. So position is everything. Since it's a drone frame, it means the diameter of the cell is larger, 5.6 or 8 or something like that, millimeters. And so what you want to consider is, can I reposition it? If it's too far away from the brood area, that's when they know to put honey in it. But if it's closer to the brood nest area, they know it needs to be brood. So it, you might move it away if you've got it in the second from the wall or the third, you might move it one more spot over toward the brood nest area and see if they won't uh, drain the honey out, move the honey out and start using it in that way. But sometimes I've seen my green drone comb, they'll have uh, uh, brood on one side, uh, drone brood on one side, and then they'll put honey on the backside. For all of you new that are just um, um, new to beekeeping, don't understand what we're talking about, a green drone comb is a plastic one piece green drone comb frame. And we use them to uh, raise drone brood. And then we will capture the mites on the drones uh, and then we'll freeze it. So we actually wait until it's capped over and the mites are underneath there reproducing. The mama mites are reproducing. And then we take it out and we freeze it for a day or two. That kills all the mites. And yes, it kills the drones, but we force them to raise a lot of drones anyway. So we're not hurting too bad. Hello, Hayden, how are you? Uh, what do you do for bees when it rains for multiple days straight? The best thing I can tell you, especially Hayden, if you're a new beekeeper with a package or a new nucleus, you got to feed them because they're drawing out this the frames and they need they need 11 pounds of nectar, approximately 10, 11 pounds of incoming nectar in order for the colony to make one pound of wax on those frames. So if it's an established healthy colony and you've had a lot of straight days of of rain, hey, you can't worry about it. Bees are just going to be in there doing household duty. But feed them if you can. If they have already got their uh, uh, frames all drawn out and they were doing a honey, they were harvesting honey, you just kind of to wait for better weather. I know we all feel that way. Hey, Donnie, uh, newbie after free bees, how can I help my new swarm draw out new foundation? Typically, Donnie, uh, anytime you have a swarm, they are wired, they are charged up and ready to draw out wax. These bees in the swarm, uh, Dr. Tom Seeley did research for years and discovered they're made up mostly of young bees. And these young bees are going to go out there in that swarm and start building comb. If they're not, again, like I just said, start feeding them and maybe that'll help them start drawing out some comb. If you have foundation that's plastic, take some wax, melt it, brush it on your undrawn foundation to give them a head start on that. 
Jason, thanks for the $5, Jason. I appreciate it so much. Looks like you made a walkaway split 30 days ago. No evidence of a queen or a queen sale. Now recombine with the original hive. When can I check the recombined hive? All right. So um, I don't know if you, uh, probably you took eggs with you maybe um, 30 days ago. I think you might have jumped the gun, Jason. Not sure. But if I understand your question right, if you make a walkaway split, it will take at least 30 days before a queen can be raised and start laying eggs. That will be extended longer if you made the split and you had pretty good season of rain, cold weather, the queen couldn't take mating flights or something like that. It could take 45 days to see eggs. Could be that you jumped a gun that the virgin queen was in the process of flying out when you were inspecting it. That's why you couldn't see it. And, um, you know, so you may not have given it enough time. If you did give it enough time and they didn't pull off getting a queen mated because she got ate by a bird on her mating flight, something like that happened, um, recombine it. Um, I would probably want to recombine it with a newspaper uh, like I would any other kind of combination of hives. And then recheck the combined hives uh, maybe a week as you combine them. Yep. See how they're doing. You don't have to wait more than a week, I don't think. That's about it. But I appreciate your question, Jason. And thanks again for the $4.99. Appreciate that a lot. It is tough to uh, deal with the queens this time of the year. Hey, Mark, appreciate the $20 again. I, uh, you're so faithful to be on our live stream, and I appreciate that. Install my package of bees Saturday and put in a green drone frame. Do I wait until it's capped over to put in the freezer? Good question, Mark. Yes, um, I usually wait till it's about three-fourths of the way capped over. Um, I don't have to wait until the entire thing is capped over. You can, but sometimes if you wait a little bit too long, part of the top of it where the eggs might have been laid a few days earlier might start to emerge, letting out some of those mites. So I kind of wait until it's almost all capped over. So at the bottom, I'll have uh, an inch or two that's not capped over yet, I still think it's going to be capped over any minute and the mites are jumping in there anyway, but the majority is capped over and then I'll freeze it for a couple of days and then put it back in my hive. Now, I don't do anything with my green drone comb. Some people scrape the cappings off. Some people scrape the whole thing off. I let the bees do it all. The bees clean it. The bees pull out the, the uh, dead uh, pupae drones with the mites on it and clean up shop. So um, you wait till about it's at least three quarter capped over and that'll work really well for you. Absolutely. Jason, again, I, uh, I didn't have newspaper. I used brown paper bag. I panicked, placed a queen excluder between the combined boxes. Okay, not bad idea. So let's say I used a brown paper bag and a queen excluder, I guess. So um, that is fine. Yeah, cut a couple of slits in the brown paper bag. That'll give them a head start of getting used to each other and they will go through that uh, queen excluder after they get rid of the brown paper bag and uh, things will be pretty good. If you leave the queen excluder between your combined boxes, um, what's going to happen is that obviously the queen's going to be in the lower box unless you did take a virgin queen to the top box that she had just flown in and you didn't see it. You'll have two queens that may meet at the queen excluder be able to reach each other and kill each other, or even the hives themselves can touch each other and kill each other, uh, kill the two queens uh, at the queen excluder. Two queen excluders would keep them apart maybe, but they, uh, they do have uh, different types of boards that you can put in there that are made for that, that the bees can pass, but the queens are spaced out so they can't touch. But I think, I think you need to wait a week and then carefully, examine your first box on top, see if you see any eggs or a queen or anything, then take that queen excluder off, let them be one hive. Alyssa, Elsie, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Uh, I'm not sure my queen is well mated. She emerged during all the rainy weather we had. How long should I wait before giving up on her and requeening? About the maximum time that we have found that a, a virgin queen will wait around and before she gives up, the mating flight is about three weeks. So we would think that a virgin queen uh, is going to be able to sustain this 
desire to mate for three weeks after she emerges from her cell. So I'm not sure where you're at on that time zone, but I'll tell you what, it would be really, really rare for her not to go out and mate. I, in all my years of beekeeping, I've been beekeeping since the early 90s, I may have seen two times when I noticed a virgin queen never went out and mated. And that could have been caused from something like she had an imperfection, either in her um, navigation ability or her wings weren't properly able to, to flap. <laughs> you know, there must have been something else that kept her from taking a mating flight. So I don't know if, if, if you're not at the three week point yet, give her a little bit more time and see how it goes. Hi, Anna. Thank you for the $5 donation. I appreciate it. When is the best time to split after queen cells are charged? Um, good question. Well, if, if I understand you right, you're saying that the queen cells are capped over um, and you need to make a split, perhaps? I'm not sure what, exactly what you mean by charged. If a queen cup is charged, that would be a different story. So not sure how to answer this other than let's go with what you said, a queen cell. Um, if they're capped over and you're sitting there looking at this hive that has capped over queen cells, boy, that's the time to make the split and just split them right then. You don't want them to emerge or they'll fight and you're only going to have one. So go ahead and uh, split this hive. Carry some of the frames that have those queen cells. Uh, keep some back home Send some over to the other split as well. That gives the odds of you having a queen in both places. Now, if you're talking about queen cups that just start showing signs of royal jelly and a larvae in them, I just do it the same way. I wouldn't really wait any longer. They're, they're raising queens. They're ready to make those. They're ready for you to split them. Yeah, you see those make a split. Hey, John. John says, hi, Dave and Sherry. Thanks for all the all your guidance. We just grafted eight queens. The bees closed the cells, but built additional comb off two cells after three days. Is this normal behavior or a problem? It's only a problem in that it's a little tougher for you to kind of see what's going on. Also, we want the bees to have access to those cells, so like I said earlier, they can massage it, they can form it, they, they like to keep it warm by getting close to it at all. So I have had that happen to me before. Actually, I was gonna show a picture of that, <laughs> but I didn't put it up. But I've had that happen several times. And it just means that your bees were very in wax making mode. And about only thing you can do sometimes about that is give them more frames, more boxes to be drawing out comb. Maybe when you're doing that, give them some, if it's a tight box, like a, I don't know, a starter box or something, or if it's a finishing hive, give them a frame that's not drawn out yet and let them put some time into that as well. But yeah, not a big deal. I've raised queens, but what you do need to do is go out there and trim it as close as you can to where that cell is. Don't damage the cell. Get as close as you can to expose it. William, thank you for your $13.99. I appreciate your donation, William, so much. Looks like a nice German Shepherd there, too. Um, I've always wanted to, to have a German Shepherd. I've had other anim other dogs, uh, like my favorite dog is, um, I've, I've had a little Dachshund. That was a, that's a dog that looks like it needs another pair of legs in the middle. A little Dachshund, is that right? Yeah. Then I've had Doberman pinchers. I've really enjoyed Dobermans a lot. But then you have to deal with trimming their ears and their tail and everything. But they're they're cool dogs. I'm a very new beekeeper. Your videos have been absolutely incredible to me. Thank you for all your hard work and dedication you've put in. Well, William, that means a lot to me. Thank you. I really do appreciate that. It is a lot of work that takes a lot of time. So I really, I'm glad you noticed that. Hey, Jay Glosser, how are you, Jay? Getting ready to do a hive inspection and split a hive this weekend. Um, I have a hard time finding the queen. If I find queen cups with an egg, the hive, need, uh, the hive needs replaced. Um, well, if you do a hive inspection, first thing you want to do uh, is look for eggs. And what I, what I want you to do uh, this time, Jason, is just see if the queen is laying eggs. You're going to, if you're farsighted, wear some reader glasses so you can see up close and use a magnifying glass, do something, look for eggs. Then I want you to look for larvae. That'd be the small little developing larva in the base of each cell. See how that looks. You see a lot of those swimming in royal jelly. And then look for cat brood. You might see 
capped over brood, that would be the pupa that are capped over the pupae. And then see how much you have of that. If you have a lot of it you know, on frames, one or two or three frames, your queen is fine. There's no need to replace her or be concerned or replace the hive or anything. It's only um, where you start kind of panicking and think, I don't see any brood that your queen needs to replace. And they will do that if you see a cup with an egg in it and poor brood pattern, let it go. We'll always let super seizures happen. I wouldn't tear those down. Hey, Eric, good to see you, Eric Scott. I believe I have a super seizure queen cell on a new package. I noticed 14 days ago, capped over, no evidence of new queen. I'm worried my package bees will die off before the new queen is laying. You know, that happens a lot of times. I, I'm not sure why it does. Sometimes it seems like the bees in a package want to raise their own uh, new queen. Now, let me tell you this. Uh, when you catch a swarm, many, many times you have to remember a swarm has the old queen in it. The old queen is the one that swarms with the um, swarm. Now, as soon as they get kind of settled down in their new home, it seems pretty frequent that I've seen the queen will lay some eggs and they will quickly start raising a new queen and get rid of their old queen because they know she's old. Everything's new. They have new comb. They have new wax. They have a new house. They have a new home. So they just want a new queen too, I think. In your case, packages used to be called swarms in the old days. People used to say, I need to buy a swarm instead of a package. But they're, they're really not swarms per se, but yet they kind of are. So they could have a tendency to want to replace their queen, but it's pretty unlikely. Um, I would say just uh, ride it out and see if they're going to be able to raise that queen, get her mated, and for everything to be okay. And I think that's important. Hey, Steve. Whoop, I lost you, Steve. Hey, Steve. Your nectar flow is just starting. You have two deeps on. You have a queen excluder. You've added supers above, but they're backfilling the brood chamber instead of drawing comb in the supers. Uh, any tips to get them to move up? Absolutely. Absolutely. So here's Steve's scenario, everybody. Listen, he's got two deep high bodies. He put a queen excluder. He, had, he added his supers up there. What's wrong with this scenario? Well, a queen excluder is not the funnest thing for worker bees to walk through. So here's my suggestion. Take the queen excluder off. Take all the supers off except one. Put that one super right on top of your two brood nest boxes, the two deeps. Let them have free access to that super to draw the wax out. That helps so much. It really does. That leaves you with a problem. Thank you, S.A. Pfeiffer, for your super sticker of $20. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. So the problem that you're going to have when you uh, take off your queen excluder and allow them to draw the wax out in the super, queens love new wax. Yeah. So she'll be up there wanting to lay eggs in your honey super. So you're going to have to watch it. Do what I say. Pull the queen excluder out. Only have one super above the uh of the brood boxes and go back in about five days and look to see if they're drawing out the middle section. Just pull out the middle super, see if they're drawing out wax. What you're wanting to do is kind of let them start drawing out wax before the queen gets up there. Once they draw two or three frames out, uh, wax uh, on the frames, then heavily inspect those frames and make sure the queen's not there and then you can put your queen excluder back under there because they're used to going up there. If you see the queen up there, then you need to pick her up, put her back down, then put your queen excluder up, uh, in between the super and the deeps. If you don't like picking up your queen, here's what you can do. Find her on the frame and gently shake her off down onto the deep. She'll go down there. Queen excluder, super top cover. That makes a lot of sense on it. it. It works so often. All right. Uh, Carolyn or Caroline, uh, when making a split, can I take three frames with the bees from three different hives and one frame with queen cells and bees from another hive? So mixing bees from four different hives. Thank you. That is a very good question. And I am a professional at doing this. I do this so often. Absolutely. Now, remember, 
um, I've taught you guys a lot in my videos about how to uh, raise queens. One of the ways that we raise queens is by we actually harvest, gather a lot of nurse bees into the starter box. So that means I'm gathering nurse bees from three or four different hives to get enough nurse bees without stripping all of them from one hive. So in other words, the answer to your question is I do it all the time in a starter box. I take nurse bees from three or four different colonies. Nobody fights. They all get along. I think it's probably going to work pretty good early in the year. In later of, in the later year, later uh, like August, September, I wouldn't do it. Bees are a lot more finicky. They're a little bit more protective. So I don't think you're going to get by with it. But in the early season, you will. Hey, Luke, good to see you. Thanks for joining us again. You know that every region is different. Boy, it is, isn't it? But what is the latest in the season? Have you actually raised a batch of queens? Oh, good question. And here's the best answer to that. If you're raising queens in any hives that are queenless, they will not kill their drones. So if you have a large uh, mating yard and you have large colonies where you're utilizing drones and you're raising queens, they're likely to not kill their drones as soon as maybe just a production colony in a backyard beekeeper's house or something. So in my case, I have easily raised queens all the way through August and into the first or second week in September. After that, the drone congregation areas are just a little too thin and I don't like to do it. I could probably get away with it. But what I do instead, Luke, is I actually will bank. I will take queens that I've raised in August because I know some people need them in September or even October and I'll, I will bank them. I've been banking queens already this year, experimenting with how long they will last and all. They're lasting very good and staying very healthy. So you can bank queens a long time if they've been mated and they've been laying well, then you can bank them. So it depends on the region. But, you know, my first frost, if this is a, a helpful little uh, bit of information, is usually the first week in October. So I stop, I stop raising queens a month before my first frost. So it works for me that way. Yeah. Sherry, wow, and you spell your name the same way as my wife, Sherry. That's impressive. Wow, I, I don't know if I've ever seen it spelled the same. That's great. Last Saturday, I did a snow grove split on one of my hives. How long should I wait to check to see if they're making a queen, or should I just leave them alone? A snow grove split. Oh, let's see. Snow grove is when you put the queen in the bottom. I often confuse it with the other one, the Damari. Oh, I'm thinking Damari, aren't I? Okay. Um, well, um, anytime that you are dealing with um, making a queen, having a queen produce, always use this same um, information. From the time that they realize they're queenless until they raise a queen and she emerges, it's going to be about 16 days. Thank you, Charlie, for your $10. I really appreciate that. Good to hear from you, Charlie. Good to see you. Um, but, you know, just use your use the timing, okay? I put, I put all these frames in here with eggs or whatever, and I think they may start raising a queen. And so I'm going to check back in about 16 days, see if the queen's out, or it's going to take about 30 days before you see any evidence of that uh, queen laying well. Thank you, David, for your $10. Just a small thank you to you and Sherry. I really appreciate that, David. I really do. Um, I really do appreciate you guys mentioning Sherry because I feel like at times uh, you guys know me, you see me, you're acquainted with all of the stuff that I do on the videos and everything. But Sherry is the main one that's always making things happen. <laughs> and she gets no credit, no popularity like I do. It's like, hey, we want to talk to David. Hey, we want to see David. But it's, uh, it's Sherry needs some of that uh, pat on the back, too. So I do appreciate you uh, mentioning Sherry as well. Hey, Zach, good to see you. How long is the queen bee typically gone on her mating flight before she comes back? I read once, you know, I can't remember the study. I can't, I can't cite this study. I apologize. But I read once it's an average of about 17 minutes that she, the virgin queen, leaves 
goes out, mates with 20 or 40 drones. Each mating episode takes two seconds. And then she flies back home about 17 minutes. Now, I have gone out there before, painstakingly watched. And I did see the queen, Virgin Queen leave the colony. And I waited the full 17 minutes. And she never came back. I went on another 10 minutes or so. And I either was, I missed her. Because a lot of bees at that time of the year are flying in and out. So typical to miss her. Or she took longer. So we don't know for sure. But anywhere from 15 minutes to a half hour for her to come back from a mating flight. Thomas, good to see you. I just installed a package today. Wow, that, that was good. I have a nuke to pick up Saturday, and I plan on checking to make sure the queen is out of her cage that day. Is that too soon? I plan to check the queen and feed. Uh, today's Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Ooh, no, that's not too soon. Um, if you had a typical plastic cage or a Benton three-hole uh, wooden cage with candy in it, um, they will eat through that candy in warm weather. If it's warmer, you got 24 hours to 48 hours, she'll be out. Don't hold me to it. <laughs> but if I'm a betting man, I bet when you inspect on Saturday, she's going to be out of her cage. Yeah, I bet so. Hey, Jeff Thomas, good to see you. David, do you have any Apame hives? If so, um, what is your thoughts on it? Yes, I do. I just installed a new package in one when uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I looked into it um, maybe a week ago, and they were getting a good start on that. But I haven't had a chance to uh, really go after it yet and, and take a look. It's different for me, to be quite honest with you. It is. I don't like having to spend a lot of time getting familiar with something new like this. <laughs> it's so easy for me to work colonies. I know how to work Langstroth hives. They're easy. I know what to do. I know how to line things up. And the Abbey hive is a little bit different. It has a difference to it that I have to think a little bit harder on. So um, other than that, I think it's going to be fine. Uh, I've heard a lot of good reports. People say they're great. So I'll keep you posted. I'll be making some videos on it for sure. You know, I don't know how to pronounce this name. Sigorn, Sigorn. I'm sorry. I wish I was better at that. Um, how close can you set swarm trap to your hive? Now, typically when a hive swarms, they will leave and they will stay probably within 20 or 30 yards of your hive. They won't go far, will they? They go to the nearest fence post tree, bicycle, <laughs> somewhere, and they'll just perch there until all the scout bees come back and tell us uh, where the final home is. So yeah, I would say there's probably a good scientific number that I don't know about, but I, I have hung them uh, pretty close into my bee yards and uh, have had success that way. So I've had a cedar tree before I cut it down. It was always a magnet for swarm. So it's a perfect place to hang one there and it worked well. So it's more, more about, you know, where are bees likely to go and try to hang them there, and that will help a lot. Hey, John, good to see you. John, a B-Team 6 member. Thanks for being a part of B-Team 6. Again, thanks thanks to you and Sherry for all your help. Also appreciate the B-Team 6 program. Well, that's good, John. I, I appreciate that. Right now, B-Team 6, a lot of you have been trying to get into B-Team 6, and we apologize, but we are at our maximum. It is full so we can't take any new members right now. So we're working hard with current members. B Team 6 is the mentorship program where I mentor 200 beekeepers that can ask me questions on my cell phone and talk with me like we're talking now and assess your situation. So thanks for being a member. Appreciate that, John. Hey, Rob, good to see you. When should I use a top entrance and what is the best way to do it? I'm not a big fan of top entrances. And the reason I'm not is because there are a lot of reasons that that can be a problem. We typically use a top entrance to speed up honey production is what I understand. And I've tried it before and it didn't really make any difference. Bees typically have their guard bees down at the lower part of the hive in their natural habitat, like a tree or a Langstroth hive. The guard bees are keeping out wasp, yellow jackets, um, uh, skunks and everything that wants to come in the front door. So the guard bees are there 
if you have two openings, sure, we could put guard bees up at the top, but sometimes I noticed there weren't any guard bees at the top, guarding the top entrance, and that bothered me. The other thing is small hive beetle love to find little places to get into the honey a little quicker without having to walk all the way through the whole brood nest area. And so it can, you know, allow more small hive beetle, more hornets, yellow jackets, ants, anything can go in that upper entrance if it's down, the only entrance is at the lower part, they're gonna have to fight the whole brood nest area to get to where the honey is. That's my hesitation of using the upper entrances, if that helps you any. Hey, Randall Lane, how many nukes should you start out with if you're just getting started raising queens? Thanks, David. Well, it depends on how many queens that you wanna raise. Let's say you wanna raise five queens. Um, you're going to need uh, one nuke to be your starter hive, right? You're going to do your grafts, put them in your starter hive. But then you're going to need five more nukes to be your mating nukes. Each queen that you raise needs to have her own home to emerge in, go out and take a mating flight, come back, start laying eggs in. You don't want to ever put queens together. So you're going to need a total of six. One for your starter hive. I mean, you could... If you weren't going to use your starter hive, you could leave one behind. And that could be you'd leave one there and your other four. So five or six mating nooks to raise five uh, queens. Think of it this way. However many queens you want to raise, you're going to need that many mating nooks. <laughs> hey, Mr. Approachable, $5 donation. I appreciate that. I enjoy the little hat there. It's a beautiful looking hat. If I'm installing a new package and I have a couple of frames of honey from a different hive, do I need to feed them to get them started? No, not really. Nah, I don't think so. Um, they're going to enjoy consuming that honey. Um, and it's inside the hive. So if it starts raining, turning cold or something, they still have access to that honey. So no, you don't need to feed them. No, you wouldn't need to. Save a little money. Let them eat that honey. Mr. Honeybee Scratcher, $5 donation. I appreciate that. Apime hives have gotten too expensive. I'm switching back to wood hives. Yeah, I'm finding that out too with, with my extra hives that I'm working a flow hive that I'm, I've almost got that ready. Um, and the Apime hive, and I've got another one. The additional boxes that you, that you have to buy, whew, they are a little expensive, aren't they? I understand that. Um, some people like the Apime hives because they feel that the plastic, the walls have a little more insulation value. It's a little tighter area. But yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Boy, I, you know, I get stuck in old habits. Wow, Thomas, my gosh, $100 donation. I, I don't know what to say. Thank you. Thank you. That means so much to uh, me and Sherry. Wow. I'm floored. I don't, I can't read your message. <laughs> I got to soak this hundred dollar bill in just for a minute. Thank you. I really do appreciate it. The snow is gone and we're, we're, we're straight to the, oh, wow. Yeah. You almost live in Canada. You live in the U S but so close to the Canadian border. You, Tom has been pounded. He's a B team six member. He's been pounded with snow up until recently. And then it just, it went right from winter to summer, 80 degrees. Everything's perfect. Bees are great. And here's, Han, oh yeah, Hondo, one hundred dollars. To thank you for fixing my bee person, bees person problem. This is going to be the best summer ever. Say hi to Sherry. I appreciate that, Thomas. That means a lot. Yeah, Sherry heard you say hi. So always great to talk to you, Thomas. Uh, you're you're such an encouragement too. So I appreciate that. Again, thanks for that hundred dollars. Wow. Hey James, how are you? Three pound package into five frame. Eight frame or 10 frame. Hmm, hand orange covering eyes. Okay. Well, I tell you what, um, I have found that if I can install a package into a five frame nucleus, they expand faster than when I put them in a 10 frame deep. And they like that size. That's kind of a swarm receiving size, as Dr. Tom Seeley pointed out, what is the best size of box for a swarm to pick or choose? He did a lot of work there. But that little five frame nucleus really does uh, satisfy that, that little three pound package to go to work fast. But then what do you have to do? Man, you have to move them out of that really fast too. So you're gonna gain maybe a week's time. I don't know if it's worth it. I just throw them in a deep now because I don't wanna have to transfer them out so quickly. Um, but a frame just means that you're just trying to save a little bit of weight or, or space on the ground 
eight to 10 frames is only, you know, two frame, a little bit difference. An eight frame hive is typically three and three quarter inches wide, where a 10 frame hive, the length drop is 16 and a quarter, three inches. Austin Payne, ten dollars. I thought I saw a hundred. I was like, oh, not another hundred. I was one zero too many. I was still seeing zeros after Thomas's donation. <laughs> Austin Payne, I do appreciate your ten dollars a lot. It really does mean a lot. Where can I find a link to purchase the Honey Bee Family poster that's behind you? Love you guys. Like the video, B Army. I'm not sure. I've seen you say that before. You're going to, have to explain what the B Army means. But um, hey, that poster. Oh. <laughs> there it is <laughs> over there. I love that poster. I got it when I first became a beekeeper from Walter T. Kelly Company. I don't even think they exist anymore, but I did see it. And some of you need to leave a comment. Maybe Sherry can show you, but I think either it seemed like it was Man Lake or Daydance. Somebody still sells that poster and it is very accurate and it is very helpful for new, for new people to understand the age, what the eggs look like in various stages, how long it takes for, you know, the queen emerges after the egg is laid 16 days, the worker bee is 24 or 21 days and the drone is 24. So it's a, it's a great little poster. Hey, Dylan Wilson, good to see you. When will we see your next flow hive setup? <gasps> oh, I know, I'm, I, I go to bed at night thinking, I gotta get the flow hive done. Gotta get the flow hive done. It took a lot to build it, and it is going well. It's built. And now I just had to put, I got, I finally had to wait on this special little kind of uh, not so toxic varnish to put on it. So if the weather is good tomorrow, I'm going to varnish it. Wait a few days and put B team. Or I saw B team. I'm going to wait a few days and put the bees in it. Mary Ann Livingston, B team six member. Good to see you, Mary Ann. Always nice working with you on B team six as well. Put in 69. Is it too late in the season to pick up a new nuke and start a new hive? Absolutely not. Well, it depends on where you live. But I don't think so. Nah, I don't think so. Because you're starting with the queen already out. You're starting with a lot of frames of brood, uh, resources in the hive. Uh, let's face it. A lot of people's packages are not as far along yet as your five-frame nuke is. Again, depending on where you live. But in Illinois right now, heck yeah. People are getting, people are just now starting to pick up our nukes this weekend. So they're getting a start and they'll have plenty of time to explode and expand. Jerry Housewright, good to see you again. Is it safe to combine a laying worker hive to another hive? Mm, yeah. uh, I'm going to take the, the safe way out and say no, I don't think so. Probably not. Probably not. Here's what I'll tell you. In the old days, what beekeepers would do is they would disperse the different frames. And maybe if you had 10 frames, they would put a frame in each of their strong colonies. And the pheromones from the strong colony would clamp down the laying workers in those hives. So that helps a lot. Shake them out in the yard, let them fly back into other hives maybe. But I don't know if I'd combine them. It might work. The pheromones may overpower it. I kind of think it might work, but that would be too experimental for me to really tell you to do that. Yeah, a little bit rough. Uh, uh, Alisa, David, I'm a new beekeeper. I still have a hard time finding my queens. What's the easiest way to find her? Oh, I love this question so much because when I first started, I was just like you. Couldn't find the queen for nothing. There's some days now I can't find the queen. It's so frustrating, isn't it? It's like, okay, I looked through all the frames. Now it's time to go back through them. And there she is. Look, let's face it. She's not always right out in the middle wearing a crown glowing with sun rays hitting her. You can't really always see her. Usually she's covered up in bees. Um, she doesn't always have a retinue around her. And I've seen queens often down in that lower part of the frame where the comb starts and the wood of the bottom of the frame is. And she's walking along down in there and you'll never see her because bees are in the way. So it's she's not always visible. Some people think that she's always in the middle laying eggs. So that's when it's hard to find her is when she's on the on the run. Now, in my nuke boxes where I my mating boxes, oftentimes I would say not quite 50%, but often I find the queen on the wall. Isn't that so frustrating, especially my three-frame mating nuke boxes? 
because it's just three frames, the queen will be on the wall. Oh gosh, that's hard to find her. So who knows? But okay, here you go. Wait a minute, I want to answer this. Uh, I want to answer her question a little bit more. So first, start looking at the brood. If you see a frame of honey, rare to see her there. Keep looking at frames until you see a frame of eggs. You'll first maybe see older larvae. If you see eggs sticking straight up like the poster back here, that means the queen laid that egg in the last 12 hours. That means the queen is in the house. So first, find a frame of eggs. The queen is nearby. Don't waste your time on other frames. All right. Catherine, thank you, David and Sherry. I appreciate all that you do. I received a new mated queen. The hive I thought was queenless is not. Can I put her in a four frame nook with brood and bees? Oh, Catherine, this happens so much. We send out a letter when someone buys a queen from us and it says in there, check your bees again before installing the queen because we want to make sure you're queenless even after you get your new queen. And in your case, it happened, didn't it? Sometimes you don't see them because of the virgin queen taking a mating flight. She wasn't there when you looked. So you got a good question. What do you do with this new queen that you bought? Um, I think the best thing to do is, yeah, put together a little four frame nuke and uh, with some bees that, you know, make sure you don't move the queen over there, of course. And then, yeah, let them go to town. That's a good way to keep a queen on hand. For all of you that are backyard beekeepers with five or less colonies, maybe 10 or less, if you want to do this, it's a good thing to do. Get a five frame nuke. And, and transfer some frames, one or two frames over, let them raise their own queen, stretch out the other frames, and use it for a backup. Have a queen sitting over there for every hive that you have in a, in a five frame nuke box. If they're short on brood, or if they go through a season where they lose their queen, you've got a queen that you can put back in a cage with a, a marshmallow, and there you go. Hey, Chris, good to see you. Thank you for your $20 donation. I do appreciate that a bunch. Um, the nuke I received had comb drawn up pretty far since the ears were not touching. Now, when I push the ears together, it seems like they're not enough bee space. Okay, I think what you're saying is that the, the foundation was so stretched out past your ears on your frames that when you try to push your frames together, it seems like you would smash the combs together, not allowing enough space for the bees to go through. Yeah, I was looking at one of my packages that I installed, and I saw the very same thing. They drew out a big old fat comb, or maybe it was one that I already had in there that was drawn out. Or they stretched it out more. I made the decision not to smash it against the other one. I, I just didn't want to do it. If you want to take the time and there's not much in it, Chris, what you can do is take a, a serrated knife, get the bees off of it, and kind of cut it back to where it's supposed to be if you can get by with that. Now, if there's honey or nectar in it, and brood, I, you know, it's going to be messy. So you have to make that decision. That does happen quite a bit. We're approaching 8 o'clock, but we'll take a few more questions and let you guys uh, know that we want you to check out our website at honeybeesonline.com. And I assume that you know about our website if you're here watching our YouTube videos. But it means a lot to us if you check out our online uh, beekeeping courses. This is where we have a lot of courses available for you. Many of you have taken those courses, so be sure and check that out as well. Hi, Dina Wilson. I put new frames in with my nuke and didn't wax them. I thought they that they came uh, with enough on them. I was told they would build out wonky comb. I know I have one frame with wonky comb already. Oh my gosh, I sympathize with you so much. I just made a video. I just filmed it, haven't published it. And I was just so frustrated because it, it delayed my ability to make this video because I ran into a funky comb. In my case, there is a particular brand of, of foundation that I really don't know what it is, which one it is. It's older foundation that is not waxed very well at all, and they built columns on it. So I've got a video coming up, and I'm going to show you guys how I dealt with it on a new package that I installed. You can leave it, but if you leave it, it's going to get worse. It's going to be hard to find the queen. It's so frustrating. Some people say, well, it's plastic foundation always makes it wacky. That's not always true. I've seen it on wax uh, foundation as well. Um, David, are you going to be doing any more with the round hive? It seems pretty interesting and uh, love to try one. Yeah, you know, I need to move the round hive. Oh, this is going to be cool. Another video coming up. I, I just... 
I need a whole, I need like five videographers. I need five editors. I, I've got, oh, and my day goes so fast. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys how to move a hive a little bit at a time. Now, the other hives I've been moving, I've made a video of that. I've been sealing them off and taking them, you know, carrying them off. But this one, I'm going to move it a little bit every day. And I'm going to test to see on the round hive is going to be the experimental moving hive. Can I move it six inches a day, six inches every 12 hours, a foot a day? I'm going to see what I can get away with. And we're going to see how long does it take. I'm going to measure the distance of their final landing plates in my new apiary. And I'm going to just say, how long does it take to get there moving it? Going across the road is going to be a little tricky. <laughs> I may have to put a, a red cone in the road. You know, uh, bees are slowly going across. But that's going to be a fun video. See what I can get away with. Uh, Zach, Dave, my wife and I love your glasses. Oh, my glasses? Yeah. Um, they're the only pair that I have. I think they look weird on me. The only pair that I can wear that don't reflect back the bright lights that I'm looking at. You know what I mean? I've got other glasses that look better on me, <laughs> but they just look, my eyes are just white. So these really work well for me. Oh, good to see you, Gene. Thanks for showing up. Yep. See you next Thursday. So guys, I'm going to wrap it up and uh, remind you again that I really appreciate you guys so much. Love all of you. You mean a lot to us. It gives me a lot of energy to make videos for you guys. I'm here to help you in beekeeping. I want to help you in life too. I want to be an encourager. I want to be somebody that you know is um, always there. Sometimes I know it sounds weird, but if you kind of get used to somebody and their voice and you see them on a regular basis, for me anyway, it kind of like is another something in my life that is stable and it kind of helps me. <laughs> I know that sounds weird, but I'm hoping to be that person in your life, helping you with bees and also just letting you enjoy life and maybe seeing some enthusiasm that I have about bees and life. And I'll tell you again, I made a video about uh, what bees have, how bees have made me happy. And uh, I just kind of shared my heart about that. Check that video out because bees really have brought such happiness in my life because they've brought people like you into my life and other friends. I've met through beekeeping. So it means so much. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you for showing up tonight. It means so much. And I look forward to seeing you every Thursday night. We're going to have a good time as we uh, continue to meet. So I'll say good night for now. Thank you for all your questions. And thank you for appreciating me and Sherry for what we do. We appreciate you guys too. We'll see you next time.